He's written The Sustainability Advantage, subsequent book, The Next Sustainability Wave, and his latest book is called The Sustainability Champions Guidebook. Uh, please join me in giving a warm welcome to Dr. Bob Wood. such a humbling experience, my goodness. I know how many experts there are in the audience, um, and after all of those nice words, I don't know quite how I'm going to live up with this. I feel like I just died. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you for coming to my funeral. Um, so, the intent of this little presentation, and I'm, I'm aware that some of you have been standing for a while, and I, I want to respect the fact that, that there are other things that uh, you're still going to have a chance to do tonight. So. I'm going to do a much more abbreviated version of this presentation than I normally do, uh, but I just wanted to give you a sense of, um, well, let's think of the ambassadors. The ambassadors are going to go out there and try to be ambassadors for companies that maybe aren't quite as connected to these sustainability ideas as they might already be. And the challenge is how the heck do you connect with them? in a way that excites them as much as some of you already are about these partners and project green ideas. So it has to do with communicating the business case for sustainability. Uh, by now, many of you understand that there is a pretty powerful business case for sustainability. That's one thing. Communicating it is the big challenge. So we're going to go through a little bit on the language, the stages that companies go through, and the way in which you can quantify the benefits if you decide to do that. Uh, all of the slides that I'm going to be using tonight will be available to you through the Partners Project. Um, any of the spreadsheets that I reference will be also available to you as well. So the intent is to get these things in the hands of people that can use them, share them, give them away, plagiarize like crazy, sell them, I don't care. Uh, do whatever you want to do with them. But the intent here is to get some more traction in the business community. And when you've got 12 and a half businesses and 30, or three, 350,000 employees, in this particular piece of the action, that's pretty exciting leverage opportunity. So let's get it out there and help people do more than they're already doing. Let's start with the language part. I happen to like the word sustainability. There are lots of other words out there. So if you were to, to do a Google search on what these different terminologies might be, here's a random sample of some that you might come across. I know that many of you are familiar with the top one, the Brundtland Commission, that's the touchstone definition of what sustainability or sustainable development is all about. The one at the bottom, four words, you've got a fighting chance of remembering that one. Uh, the one in the middle uh, kind of appeals to me though because of the word flourish. If someone were to ask my wife how our marriage is and she said, sustainable? <laughs> <laughs> Flourish would be kind of nice to have somewhere in that conversation. So, the, the idea that this could actually be neater, better, more fun, as opposed to a bunch of takeaways, that's kind of a powerful idea. And that we need to help people understand that this is about things getting better, as opposed to removing things that we enjoy. So, when you take a look at all of these different definitions, usually you end up with a couple of themes. The top one, it's about the future, intergeneration, intergenerational responsibility, as well as us. Next one, this little blue marble that we call planet Earth, suspended in the universe, is it. We don't have any umbilical cord going somewhere else. So we have to live within the carrying capacity of this planet. And the last one is this gnarly issue of social justice or social injustice. This unfortunately widening chasm between the haves and the have-nots in the world, that's not good. It's not sustainable. So as you take all of those ideas, normally you distill it down into the three ideas at the bottom. Environmental, economic, social aspects of sustainability. Some port sometimes portrayed as the three legs of the three-legged stool of sustainability. Any one leg, uh, if it's removed, would have the whole stool be unstable. So, you need all three. Uh, of course, we want to have a good economic leg, businesses, that's okay. The idea that we have a vibrant <coughs> environment as well, restoration, conservation, all those good things. And the social leg, all the things that we as Canadians expect from our communities, the education, the health coverage, the safety, the security, good working conditions, all of those kinds of things. So, 
And the labels across the bottom of this slide actually are better labels than the word sustainability. We're talking about quality of life. We're talking about genuine wealth. We're talking about genuine progress. How many have heard of genuine progress before? Uh, get comfortable with that term. I think you're going to start hearing more about it as an alternative to the GDP or the GNP, as a measure of the country's health, wealth. So France, for example, is talking about a genuine progress indicator now. Amazing. Have you heard the genuine happiness indicator? Remember the country that has that? Bhutan. Bhutan, right. The <coughs> country sandwiched between China and India and the Himalayas. They're the happiest country in the world. Go figure. <laughs> so what we've got here are a number of metrics that are starting to creep in to legitimize the idea that if someone asks how's life, it's unlikely you're just going to whip out your bank book and show them how good life is. You know, it's, it's more than money. It's, it's more things as well. So that's what sustainability is all about. Now, if you go to a business person, a hard-nosed, frantic business person, what might you use as the language around this? Well, there's lots of different language. All of those labels have different origins, but the equal signs imply that they are starting to become interchangeable labels for the same three legs of the stool. So even corporate social responsibility is morphing into be a very holistic phrase that includes environmental as well as economic <coughs> plus social. Even the word green has, of course, environmental but also social and economic dimensions. So all three there, those labels are becoming more and more interchangeable and that's good. Uh, and as you can see, there are the three E's and the three P's as, as well, different ways of depicting this. And each of us has our favorite word. I look kind of like the word sustainability. Have any of you heard of Amory Lovins? Amory Lovins, Rocky Mountain Institute. He's a guru in this stuff. He co-authored a book called Natural Capital, a fantastic book. One of the best books on this stuff that I've read. Um, and I asked him what word he uses. And he says, well, I never use the S word. <laughs> I always use the S words. He doesn't use sustainability. So I said, what do you call it? He said, well, I call it whatever they want to call it. They want to talk about environmental stuff, we talk about environmental stuff. They want to talk about um, green stuff, we talk about green stuff. Whatever they want to call it, we call it. So he's very careful about his language, which leads me to the point here. If you're about to undertake a conversation with someone who is a known, renowned skeptic on this stuff, don't use <coughs> that language. So what are you going to use? Well, use the language of business. Why don't you just call it asset management? Because that's what it is. We're talking about managing the various kinds of capital that the company is directly or indirectly dependent on for its livelihood. So of course, this one's a no-brainer, right? The financial one. Most business people understand that one in space. But the natural capital one, that's, that's the source, direct or indirect source of the energy, the materials, the water, the food, all of the things that the company needs to be a good company. And then the last part, human capital, passion capital, it kind of goes with that, the energy that people bring to the, the job. And social capital. Social capital is code for what? When you think of social capital, what is that? <coughs> Goodwill. Goodwill. With who? With your, all your Beautiful, thank you. All the stakeholders, your relationships you have with all of your, especially important stakeholders, right? Your customers, your suppliers, your investors, the regulators, all of those folks that are in your purview and are important to you. So social capital is just code for good relationships with all of those important people. You want to have a good reputation with them. Human capital, of course, is people inside the company, uh, human resources, that kind of thing. And of course, you want to have sustainable value creation. So, what's this all about? It's about language. The point here is we need to be very careful that we talk the language of the people we're trying to engage in these conversations. And this is comfortable business language, so for some people this is more inviting as the language to use. I remember talking to some non-governmental organization folks about this language thing, and somebody in the back said, oh, you mean you want us to talk soon? Yeah, talk soon. Right. So, talk the language of the people you're trying to engage in this, instead of insisting that their language is all wrong and they should be using sustainability language. Get with the program here. We need to get some momentum going, get some traction. You can get to the other language later on, but if you want to set the hook, you need to be able to engage with them in language they understand. They get that. 
Okay, these are the stages that companies go through as they start to embrace sustainability as a potential business strategy. The first place, a good place to be, so people normally move up to the second stage, which is the compliance stage. And for a lot of companies, because of the expense and the bureaucracy in that evolution from one to two, they're not excited about going any further and getting more expense and more bureaucracy. But the irony is it gets better as you go up. So companies voluntarily go to stage three. They go beyond complying with the regulations, the health and the environmental and labor kind of regulations in their jurisdictions. Why? Because of those three reasons. And you saw on the slides, you heard in the, the testaments here, most people get their toe into that water for very good business reasons. They can save money, right? Which is what eco efficiencies are all about. It's saving money on one of four things. Energy, which is the biggie. Water, not so big because we don't charge enough for it. Waste handling, second biggie. And materials, either in the manufacture of the products or the packaging of the products. So they can reduce some of that material required, dematerialization, whatever you want to call it. So saving money on energy, water, material, and waste handling is eco efficiencies. That's the low hanging fruit of sustainability. Most companies get it on that, and they're trying to do more on that. And that's the beginning of the journey of going further. PR crisis, you don't want to get hit by one of those the way Nike did or other companies have. Uh, so you want to get ahead of regulations and get ahead of public expectations. What was the problem with Nike? Child labor, but where? Yeah, so somewhere else, right? Somewhere else. The interesting thing was Nike was very proud of their sustainability track record because they put out a report every year regaling themselves and all of their important stakeholders with how terrific they were. Why? Because they were talking about Nike. And then all of a sudden the public said, excuse us, we would like you to talk about your supply chain. And they said, but we don't own the supply chain. Said, yeah, but you're still accountable for the conditions in that supply chain. That's a whole sea change. And you get that sea change going on, and all of a sudden, the rules are just unpredictable. And that's that twitch level in businesses, which is getting companies to start thinking about, good God, we could be blindsided by some other set of expectations if we're not careful. But Nike and The Gap and a few other companies got really, really hammered by the fact that people were expecting them to be accountable for their supply chain. Huge, huge change. <clears throat> All right, so beyond compliance. By the way, beyond compliance, just to help you understand, I used to work in, in IBM uh, Canada for 34 years uh, until 2000, and um, we were in a beyond compliance phase. We had a group that were the uh, environmental experts, environmental affairs, did wonderful things, saved a lot of money, looked after all the chemicals really well, won awards. Then there was another group that looked after the social leg of the school, community stuff, uh, computers in schools, volunteerism, philanthropy, all that good stuff, won awards for it, really good stuff. Neither of those two <coughs> groups talked to each other. By the way, things are very different now, but at that point they, they didn't. And they were both behind the green wall. They did their shit, and the rest of us got on with making money. <laughs> Happy they were doing whatever the heck they were doing, but totally divorced from the relevance of that to what we were doing, which was selling and servicing hardware, software, and that kind of stuff. So. That's stage three, run by experts. Good experts, but marginalized by the rest of the business. Stage four, you know, by the way, that's a step from two to three. That is a leap from three to four. There are no companies in stage four today. But aspiring to it, you bet. Why? Because they can get more business value. Stage four is when everybody in the company is thinking of the environmental and social impacts of their decisions on the fly, as they make them. It's baked into the culture of the company. Everybody, executives, middle management, first line employees, everybody is thinking of this. It is a different kind of company. Why? Because it makes them a more successful company. Come back to that and how to quantify it. Stage five, I won't belabor that. Many SMEs, as, as you probably know, 98% of the companies in the world are 500 employees or less. Um, in fact, if you just take the small, which is, what, 100 or less? 100 or less? Uh, it's 95% of the companies in the world, so more? 98, 79% of those countries. No kidding. No kidding. Wow, okay, so a lot of them. <clears throat> so what we've got here is a group of companies who are too small actually to usually show up for events. They, they, they're busy, they're, they don't have the time, they don't have the inclination, they're just getting on with it. And the interesting thing about stage five <coughs> is sometimes they're founded by people that just get it on this. They, they understand this stuff. They don't call it 
sustainability. They just call it a good way to run a business. Their personal values about environment and social things permeate the culture of the company. And they don't blow their horn about it. They don't even describe it. It's just the way to run a business. So they're just quietly doing their thing for values-based reasons. Terrific. We don't have to talk to them because they get it on this stuff. It's the, four, the stage four folks we need to kind of work on. Behaviors of stage five and stage four are very, very similar. In fact, usually indistinguishable. It's the motivations that are different. Stage five companies do it because it's the right thing to do. Stage four companies do it because it's good for business. Now, they're not exactly polarized, but they're a little different in the way they, they think of the motivation. Frankly, I'm not hung up on motivations anymore. At my agent stage, you know, I kind of work on behaviors. We'll work on the motivation some other time, because we're running on a runway on some of these behaviors, and uh, we need to get on with it. So whatever works. You know, they want to make more money and do the right things, fantastic. Let's show them how they can do that. Then we'll work on more profound reasons that that's the right thing to do as well uh, after they start to clean up their act. So let's come back to stage four. The purpose of this talk is to help you want, engage with companies and have them want Voluntarily, not driven by regulations, you want to get to stage four because you cannot drive a company to stage four by regulations. Regulations have a very, very important part to play because they keep the platform high enough for all the laggards to, to stay in line. But what we're talking about here is the holy grail here of companies that are really, really into this. So let me just ask you, think of your own companies. How many of you are at stage one? Stage two? Stage three, stage four, stage five. Fantastic. So a good cross section here. Uh, and sometimes it helps if you know a little bit of that before you have the conversation with the company so that you can connect with them in the right way. All right, so coming back to stage four. We're going to enhance the value of a company. How would you know the value if you saw it? Well, there's a metaphor here that might be useful. The company value iceberg, the part above the waterline which you can touch and feel, and the, the whole iceberg which is called market capitalization. So these are the labels that kind of help flesh that out. The accountants help you with the tip of the iceberg. That's what business schools are all about. The stock market helps you with the whole iceberg, the market capitalization, which is simply the value of each share multiplied by the number of shares. You end up with the market cap. That's really simple. Assets minus liabilities is the tip, and the stuff in between, we don't know what to call it, so we call it what it's not. Intangibles, non-financials, extra financials, reputation, brand image, all of those relationships we talked about before, the social capital. Mush, mush. Now the stock market helps you evaluate all of that because it does the calculation in terms of prices times the number of shares. What if you're an SME and you're not listed on the stock exchange? What do you call that bottom part? What do you call that stuff that's not the hard stuff? Goodwill. Right, and how much do you get for goodwill from the usual account? Zip. Somewhere between zero and a buck. So, if you're an SME, you call it goodwill. So, does this logic apply to you? Yes, it does, because even though it's not usually valued very well, if you ever went public, it certainly would be. Uh, but the principle is, is the same. Now, the interesting thing about this is not so much the top and the bottom, it's the waterline. Back in the early 80s, most of the value of a company was hard stuff, about an 80-20 split. By the end of the 90s, it was more like a 30-70 split. Today, it's more like a 20-80 split. So, if you're paid on stock or stock options and you're a big wheel in a company, you start to worry about the bottom as much as the top because that's a proxy for share price, which is very important to you personally all of a sudden. You with me on that? So you don't want that bottom part eroded. But swimming around the bottom part of the iceberg are all these stakeholders we talked about before. And some of those folks are getting a little bent out of shape about some of the things the company is doing or not doing. So they get a little bit more agitated. Usually the ones that historically have been really concerned are the non-governmental organizations like who? Who are the activists? Greenpeace. Hospitals. Hospitals, interesting. Sierra Club, you know, the, the ones that, that publicly embarrass companies and make it their business to do that. And then there are the scientists who have been blowing the whistle for quite a while, uh, trying to get our attention on these things. And uh, unfortunately, neither of them have a lot of clout in the business community. Who are the important stakeholders to the business community? 
Name three. Banks. Customers. Customers, absolutely. Banks. Banks, oh yeah, you want to make sure that you're on the good side of the banks, right? Who else? Employees. Employees, right, very, very important. So, here's the interesting point. In the last five years, whatever the NGOs and the scientists have been trying to get the attention on in the business community has had a chorus starting to join and sing from the same hymn book in different languages. All of those folks there are starting to get a little bit upset about how the companies are or are not performing in terms of their environmental and social reputation. So there are some risks that they can bring to the bottom of the iceberg and some nice opportunities to the top. So it's a two-part business case. Make sure you, you mitigate the risks and that you capture the opportunities. And these storm clouds, sustainability storm clouds, are roiling that sea of stakeholders big time. So, waste and toxicity been around there forever. Poverty and social justice, big deal, not only somewhere else, but here in North America as well. Uh, species extinction and over-harvesting, big issue, big issue. But the biggest one is the one in the middle, which is for some reason almost illegible. But it says climate change and the energy crisis, which is really joined at the hip by fossil fuels. A close second of that is food and water. Watch, watch water. That one's coming on strong. Big deal. Not only in, in Australia after a 10 year drought in India and China and so on, but in the western part of the continent here. Big issue. Big issue. I can talk quite a lot. Oh, I won't. Okay, so water can be a big issue. And food, closely connected, right? About 70 to 80 percent of the water in the world is used for agriculture, so big deal. But energy and, uh, and the climate change crisis are the biggest lightning rod that are really getting the attention of the folks deep below the water line. So that's what I'm going to talk a little bit about and give you a sense of how these five stakeholders are upset or concerned about some of these issues uh, in a way that's getting the attention of businesses. And by the way, climate change, there are still a few non-believers out there on this climate change thing, but I just want you to understand. <laughs> so something's going on out there. Right? <laughs> so we're starting to clue into this. Maybe it's because of the Al Gore movie and books and DVD and talks and all that kind of stuff. Maybe it's because of Hurricane Katrina. Both of which happened around 2005-2006. That was a turning point. Most of us until that time said we were going to buy green, that we really cared about this stuff. Only 10% of us ever did. 2006 it doubled. 20. 20 is a very magic number in change. You get 20% of a population on board and magic starts to happen. It's called a critical mass. So if you're in the retail business and you could care less about climate change, all of a sudden your opinion just became irrelevant. Because your customers do. And that's growing. And even in 2009, that's still between 30 and 40 percent. It's amazing. People are using this as a criteria for household products, for appliances, those kinds of things, because they care about them. And it's fanned by the media support for all of these things. So, customers care. Employees, big time. So there are a lot of surveys that show, as the first two do, uh, that people leaving university are looking for companies that have good reputations on corporate social responsibility, CSR, so that they feel proud working for those companies. They want to stay with the companies, which is the third bullet, and the last one is the most important one. They're more productive working for those companies because they're proud to work for them. They're energized. They <coughs> like that company. And they unleash their creativity and help the company be better. Huge. Really, really huge. Third, economists. How many have heard of the Stern Report? Wow. That's unusual. That, that's great. That's unusual. Really informed audience. Okay, so I'll just keep the pace going here. Uh, you'll notice that he put some metrics around this before. This was a message economists had de delivered about five years before, but without the numbers. And what he did was he said, we better get on with this stuff because it's going to cost us a small fortune later to get the climate change under control. Much, much more. Five to twenty times more than what it would cost us if we start now. The second point is huge economic benefits if we're smart about it. Worst global depression in the history of mankind if we're not. And the third one, and this is the interesting one, is Canadians. We need to put a price on carbon. And we have two choices. We can do that with a tax or we can do that with cap and trade. But we have to put a price on carbon because we have to be able to get our carbon emissions down to 80 to 90% below 1990 levels by 2050 or we're cooked. Which happens to be what the climate scientists are saying, which is kind of an interesting echo from them. 
right? So the economists are very concerned about the economy, the economic impact of this. And the third, uh, the next one is the investor community. How many have heard of the Carbon Disclosure Project? Cool. Okay. So as you know, it started in 2003. By this year, it's ramped up to the point that we've got folks that are huge institutional <coughs> investors still, despite the recession, very, very interested in the carbon footprint of companies. So what they do is they just go and ask, in our case, uh, 200 of those 3,700 companies were in Canada, 500 in the U.S. and the rest of the rest of the world. So these are the largest 3,700 companies in the world. And what they're basically asking is, Mr. CEO, what's your carbon footprint? Just curious. Why would they care? Why would they care? Why would an investor care what the carbon footprint is of a company? The price of carbon is going up. Right. And when we put a price on carbon, it's not an if, when, probably through a cap and trade approach, companies that are very dependent on fossil fuels, as you can see from the, the bottom bullets, some of them will do fine if they're not dependent, and others that are very dependent are going to get hammered. Now, an investor could care less, right? All they want to know is, are you going to have a problem with this or not? And if you are, you're a risky investment, so we'll put our money somewhere else. This slide and the other one are very, very significant. When you give investors and economists working on this, think of the three legs of the stool. Remember the three legs of the stool? Are they concerned about the social leg? Not so much. Are they concerned about the environmental leg? Not so much. It's the economic leg. And all of a sudden, this thing has morphed from being a greeny tree hugger issue to a hard-nosed economic investment business issue. And that's happened in the last four years. That is a sea change. When you get those voices in the chorus, everything changes. And it's phenomenal what's going on out there across the world. Not only in Canada and the US, but across the world. It is incredible. Last point here, we may think as Canadians that we're way ahead of the U.S. I just want you to understand that they're not so bad, actually. A lot of cities, over a thousand as of this morning, have signed up for this climate protection agreement, which in, in effect says that they're going to try to honor the, the Kyoto Protocol at the city level. And these are little dinky towns. These are New York, Chicago, Los Angeles, Washington, Houston, and so on. These are big cities that have signed up with uh, a strong commitment from their mayors that they're going to get their act together on this. And then you get these clusters of states, the West Coast led by... West Coast led by... Arnold. I mean, go figure, right? I mean, anyway, whatever works. So Arnold has got religion on this. Midwest states all over it. Uh, especially south of Superior and just west of Lake Michigan. There's something about those Minnesota and, uh, and, uh, Wisconsin. Wisconsin, thank you, thank you. Amazing stuff going on. Then there's the East Coast states as well, and then Florida all by itself. But they're all coming up with cap and trade systems, and it's going to drive companies nuts if they're all different. So, of course, there's pressure on the feds to level a playing field, have a consistent federal cap and trade system. And as you can see, there are four of us, provinces, Ontario included, that have joined with them. So let me tell you, it's happening at the city level. You go anywhere in the world, that's where the action is. Next level up, states and provinces. Next level up, last ones to get it, feds. That's the way it works. Some people say that leadership at the federal level is finding a parade and getting in front of it. Anyway, you know, sooner or later they'll put it in. So what we've got here as well is a lot of corporate support, individual corporate support, collections of corporations that are really being very proactive on this. So a lot is happening. And essentially what they're saying collectively <coughs> is, get your act together, Mr. CEO, because we're getting a little upset about the way in which you are not or are uh, behaving and we think that you should be more socially and environmentally responsible, especially on your carbon footprint. Now, that's a risk if you don't step up to it. Uh, if you do, that's okay. You okay on the risk part? That's, that's an important part of the business case because that gets their attention. Then they're ready to sit still for the quantification of the business case. When I wrote the first book, which was on quantifying the business case, I said, God, it's so compelling. They should be lining up for this. Why isn't everybody doing that? Because the risk factor wasn't high enough at that. That's what you need to kind of wake them up, the burning platform part, and then they get excited about it. Walmart, when they first started to do their stuff on environmental stuff, never talked about the savings. And then they said, geez, this is, this is kind of good. 
But originally, they were just in damage control on that. Okay, so opportunities. You go to a company, you start as an ambassador, you start to talk about opportunities, their eyes will glaze over. Why? Because they've already got a lot of opportunities waiting for them right now, driving them nuts. So those are the things that are already on the plate of these very, very busy people. And we come along and say, we've got another opportunity for you. We say, well, okay, we'll put it down here at the bottom. We'll get to it because we care about that stuff, but we just got these other important things to do first. So this is the second most important slide. It's called positioning. Don't call it a goal. Call it an enabling strategy for the things that are already goals. It's a way to get them sooner and better than they otherwise would have. So it's a way to get these things which are already driving them nuts to happen in a more powerful, dynamic way, a better way. So let's take the acid test, the one at the top left. Profit. Can a company actually make more money? If they pay attention to this, yes. Second question, oh yeah, how much? Well, if you're a large company, 38% more profit in five years, fully costed, no hidden tricks or anything, and that's a low ball number. And if you're an SME, small and medium sized enterprise, at least 66% more profit. Both those numbers are factored down five times to get them down that low because I was trying to be really, really, really low ball, kind of conservative. Where do I get the numbers from? Case studies. These are real companies. In fact, this is five, seven years old. A lot of this, this data is it's so much better today. You can see incredible results that companies are getting from what they're already doing. So th this is a, uh, a very interesting exercise to try to figure out where those benefits are coming from. Where, where do we get all of those things to add up? Well, we get it from these six areas for SMEs. This is where the meat comes from in the middle, the eco-efficiency, savings on energy, water, material, and waste handling, as we talked about before, the low-hanging fruit, fantastic. Nothing wrong with that, go for it, it proves the point. But it's in the, in the sandwich of HR stuff at the top, because you're able to attract, retain, and get more productivity from folks because they get excited about this stuff, and you have more revenue streams from people that are starting to vote with their wallets for <coughs> the things that they want. So, Opportunities for additional revenue and maybe a break on your borrowing cost because you're a better ri risk uh, in the view of the insurance companies and the banks. So how much in each of those areas? Approximately this amount. This is the starter set. So if you use this spreadsheet that will be made available to you, inside that are all of the assumptions that generate those kinds of numbers. They don't add mathematically to 66% because 66% is the bottom line result of those. Some of those are top line numbers. The plus six is the improvement in productivity. And so an improvement is a plus sign. Revenue is going up as a plus sign. The other is going down as a good thing because you're saving money. Uh, and all of the logic behind that are baked into the spreadsheets. In fact, um, they're pretty well self-explanatory. The nice thing about it is you can plug in the numbers for a particular company and see what's in it for them. And if it's good, terrific. And if it's not, that's life. But I think you'll be surprised. So what we've got here are some ways to quantify the opportunities, point out some of the risks of not getting on board, and as ambassadors, if you're trying to get the attention of folks, maybe you want to start with the risks and to the capital, the assets of the company, uh, and then help them quantify the opportunities and use the spreadsheets as a catalyst for dialogue. <coughs> so what we're talking about here is trying to get a critical mass of companies up to four or five, I don't care. Um, <coughs> How many have read The Tipping Point or heard of it by Malcolm Gladwell? Great, great book. Um, I think we've probably got 3 to 5% of the companies in the world on board now. We just need another 15 to 17%. We can all kick back and watch this happen, right? It's, it's just going to happen by itself. Because when you get that percent on board, especially the right percent, the right companies, magic happens. All of a sudden, it's normal to do this stuff, expected to do this stuff. So it's pretty exciting. Now, in a recession, does this stuff work? Yes, it does. So if you're a company trying to survive in this god-awful economy, here are some strategies that might work. Save money. <coughs> Not a bad idea, because you can't borrow any. It's kind of tight on credit. So how do you save money? Equal efficiencies. Second and third one have to do with whatever employees you have left. Uh, trying to increase their productivity. Get them excited about maybe bringing back their colleagues that were laid off. Uh, and also reinvent, and this is an interesting idea, you may actually want to reconsider what your company does. 
take advantage of the lull, step back and reflect. Do you really want to keep doing this after the economy recovers? Or do you want to reinvent yourself, to position yourself to capitalize on some of the characteristics of the new economy, which is the next slide. And of course, if there's money you can tap into, go for it. There are experts out there that can help you do that. Or if your customers can, so they can pay for your goods and services, that's even better. So obviously, if there's stimulus money, smart business to go for. Now, what will the post-recession economy look like? <coughs> Here's one slide that kind of summarizes people's assessment of what that might look like. Apparently, it's going to be a low-carbon economy. That is to say, we're going to wean ourselves off fossil fuels. That's probably a good thing. Local, more local supply chains, not all local supply chains, but more local supply chains for food and goods and so on because of the transportation impact on climate change, etc., and the cost of moving, moving goods. Uh, services versus products, people will be renting and leasing things and sending them back to the original manufacturer after they're finished with them. Dematerialization of everything. Look at the next two. Responsible consumption, actually saving money. Whew, incredible idea. Uh, and a no growth model for companies, that this, um, this relentless growth that is expected of companies maybe isn't the right way to view companies. When's that one going to start? I don't know. season right now. Yeah. Take that to the boss. What's the medical term for continuous growth? Cancer. Yes. Cancer, right? So, you know, maybe there's another model that might work here. And then the, the, the last, last two are kind of exciting. The whole new forms of, of ownership are starting to emerge in a lot of communities. Little, little things that are going, there's almost like a parallel economy that's starting to morph itself out of uh, communities. Sometimes community foundations are behind it with microloans and so on. Employee owned, customer owned, co ops, uh, government funding. Government funding? Who would have thought a couple of years ago that you and I would own General Motors? <laughs> Yeah, well, I that's, 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 see the opt -out. that's a discussion at the moment, right. Okay, so, and then we get a whole new company, like, what's that company for? That's actually starting to get some debate. Very, very interesting. Like, you have these models, sometimes called hybrid, where you take the best from government, best from non-government, and best from private sector, and you swizzle them together, and you come up with a hybrid approach to running a business. Social enterprise, fourth sector, all those kind of, kind of terms. So I don't think there's going to be one that wins. It's going to be a rich diversity of them, thank goodness. Um, of course, the current model will continue for a long time, but the others, I think, will start to get some traction. So it's exciting times. Everything, everything is up for grabs. Everything. And we have an incredible opportunity to make this work. So, what's going on? This is flat out smart business. Is it good for the planet? Yes. It's also very, very good for the bottom line. So it's smart business, a whole lot of things that, that businesses are expected to pay attention to, expectations of stakeholders and so on, are behind this. Lots of partners, hence the name, and opportunity for leadership. Leadership at the personal level, each of us, which I struggle with a lot because I fly way too much. Um, I was in Halifax this morning, I'm here now, next week I'm in Edmonton, but about a third of my talks this year are going to be by webinar and video conference. So I'll do the talk, but I won't be there, I mean physically be there. And by this time next year, if I have to travel to do a talk, I don't think I will. Uh, this climate change stuff is getting kind of serious and I kind of think I need to walk the talk on that stuff. So I think each of us needs to kind of reflect on that and say, okay, on a personal level, What's my footprint and how can I do something about it? At a business level, how do I engage my colleagues in this stuff in a useful way so they don't get marginalized by them, but they get excited about it, which is what that intent of that third book was all about? And how do we, as a cluster of companies, called an Eagle Business Park, how do we set a norm here that wants to be cloned by a whole bunch of other businesses in a smart way? In a smart way. Good for them, good for the community, good for everybody. It's really exciting. Really, really exciting. And you folks are in a position to really make this work. So I applaud what you're doing, both the ambassadors and everybody else that's a member of it. The push that you've got is phenomenal. The timing is perfect. And I really encourage you to get on with it. So thank you very much. <laughs>